The Witch of Blackbird Pond, Chapter 6, Part 1 Reverend Gershom Bulkley laid down his linen napkin, pushed back his heavy chair from the table, and expanded his German waistcoat in a satisfied sigh. Very excellent dinner, Mr. Slit. I warrant there's not a housewife in the colonies can duplicate your, uh, your apple tartlets. He had just better compliment that dinner, thought Kit. The preparation of it had taken the better part of four days. Every inch of the great kitchen had been turned inside out. The floor had been fresh sanded, the hearthstone polished, the pewter scoured, the brick oven had been heated for two nights in a row, and the whole family had gone without sugar since Sunday to make sure that the minister's notorious sweet tooth would be satisfied. Well, Dr. Bulkley had been pleased, but had anyone else? Matthew Wood had eaten little and spoken scarcely a word. He sat now with his lips pressed tight together. Rachel looked tired and flustered, and even Mercy seemed unusually quiet. Only Judith had blossomed. In the candlelight, she looked bewitching, and Reverend Bulkley smiled whenever he looked at her. But the greatest part of his condescension he had bestowed on Kit. Once he had understood that her grandfather had been Sir Francis Tyler, he himself, had visited, he himself had visited Antigua and the West Indies, he had told her, and he was acquainted with some of the plantation owners there. He went back to the subject now for the third time. So, young lady, your grandfather was knighted for loyalty by King Charles, you say? A great honor, a very great honor indeed, and I take it he was a loyal subject of our good King James as well. Why, of course, sir, and you yourself, are you, you are a loyal subject also? How could I be otherwise, sir? Kit was puzzled. There are some who seem to find it possible, remarked the minister, staring meaningfully at a spring bean. See that you keep your allegiance. With an abrupt scrape of wood, Matthew pushed back his chair. Her allegiance is in no danger in this house, he announced angrily. What are you implying, Gershom? I meant nothing to offend you, Matthew, said the older man. Then watch your words. May I remind you, I am a selectman in this town. I am no traitor. I said no such thing, nor did I mean it. Mistaken, Matthew, I hold to that. But not a traitor. Yet. I am mistaken, Matthew Wood challenged him, because I do not favor knuckling under to this new king's governor. Governor Andros was appointed by King James. Massachusetts has rec recognized that. Well, here in Connecticut, well, we here in Connecticut will never recognize it. Never. Do you think we have labored and sacrificed all these years to build up a free government, only to hand it over now without a murmur? I say you are mistaken, growled Gershom Bulkley. Mark my words, Matthew. If you do not live to see the evil results, your children, or their children, the fam or their children will suffer. Call it what you will, this stubbornness can only lead to revolution. Matthew's eyes flashed. There are worse things than revolutions. I know, I know more about that than you. I was a surgeon in the fort fight with the Indians. War is an evil, Matthew. Believe me. There can no good thing come of bloodshed. Who is asking for bloodshed? We ask only to keep the rights that have already been granted to us in the Charter. The two men sat glaring at each other across the table. Tears sprang to Rachel's eyes. Then Mercy spoke from the shadows. I had looked forward to hearing Reverend Bulkley read to us this evening, she said gently. Dr. Bulkley sent her a gracious smile and considered. I have to coddle this throat of mine, he decided. But my young pupil here is a very exceptional reader. I shall pass the honor on to him. Grudgingly, Matthew Wood lifted the heavy Bible and placed it in John Holbrook's hand and Rachel moved a pewter candlestick nearer to his elbow. John had been respectfully silent all the evening. Indeed, he had had little opportunity to be anything else, and he now seemed pleased out of all proportion at this slight notice from his master. Kit felt suddenly provoked at him. One week in Wethersfield seemed to have changed the dignified young man she had known on shipboard. Tonight, he appeared to be a shadow hanging on every word, from this pompous, opinionated man. Even now, he dared not assert himself, but held the Bible uncertainly in his hands and asked, What would you have me read, sir? I would suggest Proverbs, 
24th chapter, 21st verse, said the old man, with a canny gleam in his eye, which Kit understood as John began to read. My son, fear the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change, for their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? There was a harsh sound from Matthew, checked in response to his wife's pleading eyes. John continued reading. As he read on, Kit forgot the meaning of the words and felt a stir of pleasure at the sound. John's voice was low-pitched but very clear, and the words fell with a musical cadence that was a delight. Every evening since she had come here, she had sat waiting with impatience for her uncle's monotonous tone to cease. Tonight, for the first time, she caught the beauty of the ancient Hebrew verses. When the reading was finished, family and guests bowed their heads, and Reverend Bulkley began the evening prayer. A little sigh escaped Kit. Her uncle's terse petitions were hard enough to endure. This prayer, she knew, would be a lengthy masterpiece. As the husky voice scraped inexorably on, she ventured to raise her head a little, and was gratified to see that Judith, too, was peeking. But Judith's attention was not wandering. She was studying, with delicate appraisal, John Holbrook's bent head and the delicate chisel line of his profile against the firelight. A phrase of Dr. Bulkley's prayer caught Kit's attention again. And bless our sister in her weakness and affliction. Whom does he mean? Heavens, is he talking about mercy? Had the man no perception at all? How mercy must be struggling at the Folsom Road. After a few days in this household, Kit had ceased to be aware of Mercy's lameness. No one in the family ever referred to it. Mercy certainly did not consider herself afflicted. She did a full day's work and more. Moreover, Kit had soon discovered that Mercy was the pivot about whom the household moved. She coaxed her father out of his bitter mood, upheld her timorous and anxious mother, gently restrained her rebellious sister, and had reached to draw an uncertain alien into the circle. Mercy, weak? Why, the man could not even use his eyes. When the prayer was ended, the thanks repeated, and the good night said, Rachel saw her guest at the door. She held out her hand to John Holbrook. I hope you will come again, she said kindly. We would like, to, we would like you to feel welcome in our house. John looked back to where Judith stood behind Mercy's chair. Thank you, ma'am, he answered. If I may, I would be very happy to come again. As the heavy door finally closed, Matthew Wood turned fiercely toward his wife. That is the last time, he pronounced, that I will have Gershom Bulkley under my roof. Very well, Matthew, sighed Rachel, but do not be too hard on him. Gershom is a good man. Just set in his ways. He is a hypocrite and a whited sepulcher. Matthew's fist crashed down on the table, and I'll have no more texts read at me in my own house. Wearily, the women set to work to clear the table. While Matthew raked up the fire in the hearth, all at once he straightened up. There is another matter I forgot, he said. Young William Ashby asked permission today to pay his respects to my niece. A spoon clattered from Judith's finger. There was utter silence in the room as Rachel and both her daughters turned to stare at Kit. You didn't call him Catherine, and Aunt Rachel's voice was incredulous. That is what I said. But he has hardly seen her, only for a moment after meeting. She was conspicuous enough. Kit felt her cheeks growing hot. Judith opened her mouth to say something, glanced at her father, and closed it again. I suppose we can hardly refuse, ventured Rachel. He is a member of the society in good standing, and he has gone about it quite properly. His father is another kinsman, said her husband. He proposed in council that we join with Massachusetts. But what can we expect now that we harbor a royalist under our roof? Bring a candle, Rachel. We have wasted enough time for one night. A constrained trio lingered after Rachel had climbed the stairs behind her husband. Mercy began quietly to make ready her own bed in the corner. A small wrinkle of concern marred her usually placid forehead. Well, I told you so, Judith finally burst out. I knew by the way he was staring at you after meeting. There was no use to pretend she didn't remember. Kit felt a small, pleasurable stir of curiosity. Do you know him, Mercy? I know about him, of course, admitted Mercy. 
Who doesn't know about him, added Judy? Who hasn't heard that his father has three acres of the best land set aside, and the trees all marked to build the house the moment Master William makes up his mind? And he was just about to make it up, too, when you came along. You never really knew that, Judith, her sister reminded her gently. We only thought so. All at once, Kit remembered. That first morning when she was trying on that dress, Judith had said, Oh dear, she exclaimed in dismay. I don't want this William to come calling on me. Why, I've only seen him once, and I couldn't think of a word to say to him if he came. I'll tell Uncle Matthew so in the morning. Don't you dare say anything to Father, Judith whirled on her. But if he, if you, William never asked to call on me. I just said he was getting around to it. Tis not quite fair, really, Mercy considered soberly, to hold it against Kit just because he thought. Oh, I'm not holding it against Kit, Judith said airily. Suddenly she tossed her head. As a matter of fact, Kit can have William with my blessing. I've changed my mind. I'm going to marry John Holbrook.